firm we're just seeing my stuff <laughs> So Azair, you are up first. So you could, you know, Jackie, I, Jackie, are you going to introduce us? Sure. Well, we'll wait. Just let's hold for a second here for folks to get logged in. It looks like we have some people joining us. So welcome everyone who's tuned in. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. We're so excited to share more information with you. And this is my favorite lecture series the aerospace edition. So we're going to have some really cool things to learn together today. <laughs> yeah, and we'll just wait another moment or two. And then just as a heads up for everybody, we are recording this session. So I hope that's okay with you. Um, we will be loading all of these sessions onto our YouTube channel. And I'll be sure to drop a link to the YouTube channel so that you can watch all the sessions from the whole engineering exploration week. But yeah, with that, I think we're probably good to kind of get going. And I'm going to kick it over to Ellen first to get us started if you want to introduce our first speaker. Sure. Thanks, Jackie. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Pleasy, and I work in the mechanical engineering department at CSU. Um, this particular segment that you're participating on is called... Um, my favorite lecture in the aerospace engineering concentration. This is a, a new undergraduate concentration that we are offering. Uh, this is our first semester offering this undergraduate concentration. And I think you will hear that um, we have some pretty exciting things going on in the department related to aerospace. I am joined by Professor Azair Yalin, who will speak first. Dr. Anthony Marchese and Dr. John Williams. Uh, so Azair, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, can you see my title slide? Yes, we sure can, thank you. Great. Okay, well, um, it's very nice to speak with all of you today, albeit um, remotely. So thank you uh, in advance for listening. So I am, as uh, Alan mentioned, a, a professor in mechanical engineering here at CSU. Um, I've been here since about 2002, just as some, some quick background. And so I have put together a slide about um, an area that I'm excited about that relates to aerospace and, and hopefully is fun and interesting for the audience. And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about environmental sensing with um, unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as UAVs, uh, also known as drones. So the talk is going to begin with a little bit of background on, on what's going on with drones, what do they look like, what are the regulations around flying them, and then the second part of the talk will focus on some research we've done here at CSU where we do some environmental sensing with those drones. And, and of course, I'll tell you more as to what I mean by that. And I'll try to speak for approximately 20 minutes and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. So I have one slide to just say a little bit about my research group at, at Colorado State University. So we call our group the Center for Laser Sensing and Diagnostics. Um, we have a team of, of give or take 10 people, myself, some graduate students, and then we usually have some undergraduate students working with us. Um, we work in a range of areas. I've listed a few here, but um, the commonality is that they relate to laser diagnostics and laser sensors. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in laser sensors for atmospheric science and monitoring, as we'll, we'll chat about today. And I just have a few photographs here to show some former members of our group. And then I'm not sure if some in the audience have been able to uh, visit our campus, but one of the buildings that um, we're excited about and where my lab is set up uh, is what is referred to as the Energy Institute. Um, it's a little bit north of the main campus and there's an image of that there. So without further ado then, um, let's talk about drones. So I think everyone is pretty familiar with drones and I just want to begin by um, showing that there is a very large variation um, in, in drones in terms of their size, their cost, and their applications, and so on. So um, here you can see a picture of a little um, finger scale drone, uh, the world's smallest quadcopter, at least um, at the time of this article. Um, 
I gave my daughters for Christmas a rather similar little drone that they fly around the living room and, and try not to crash into the walls. Um, you've probably seen Amazon and other companies looking at um, delivery services by drones. So here's, um, here's someone trying to deliver some pizza with a kind of, this would be considered a small to medium sized drone. Um, the drones are sometimes quadcopter or multi-rotor, like a helicopter, like what I showed you earlier, uh, but sometimes more like a fixed wing airplane. And here is an example of a fixed wing drone. And in this case, it doesn't go down a runway, but, but someone literally launches it into the air. So that could be a, a fun thing for some of you to do one day. And then the drones basically get bigger and bigger. So drone or UAV does not necessarily mean small. So here is NASA's Global Hawk. So this is used for atmospheric science type studies primarily by NASA. So, I mean, this is a drone because there's no human pilot in here basically, but this is obviously a quite large um, aircraft. Uh, and then uh, it's not the focus of our talk, but the military of course does a lot with drones. So here is an image of drones used for dropping munitions. Here is an image um, of a so-called Hermes, a, a larger military scale drone. And then one last um, so-called predator sea drone. So, so look at this thing, right? This is a huge drone. Um, some of the parameters are given here, but this can fly for 18 hours at 460 miles per hour. Um, so that would also be considered a drone. So they, they span a, a huge range of scales. So I think it's fun to um, be familiar, at least briefly, with, with what are the, the policies around drones. So drones, of course, fly in the same airspace in principle as, as aircraft, sometimes over people. And so it's important that these things are um, done safely. And in the United States, this is handled by rules from the um, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, the same folks who basically um, handle regular aircraft and, and take off at airports and so on. So these rules have been very rapidly evolving and changing the last few years as these drones have become more and more available. And so here's a quick snapshot um, from the FAA website of the current situation. So one thing to know, and, and this really is meant to apply, you know, if you get a drone that you picture as a toy to go play with in your backyard, technically you are meant to register that drone with the FAA. So I encourage all of you to do that if you own drones. And then I just wanna highlight some of the key rules. So it's important that you fly your drone below 400 feet. Again, I mean, a, a several hundred dollar what you might think of as a toy drone can easily exceed that. Technically, that's not allowed, not legal. Um, you also should not fly in controlled airspace, basically mean uh, beside an airport and so on. You should keep the drone within your line of sight. It's not safe and not allowed to fly the drone further away than you can see and then assume that you'll be able to turn it around with your remote control. Uh, and then a few other things that are sort of obvious, maybe don't fly over groups of people and respect other privacy. Don't um, go snooping around in your neighbor's backyard. Commercial uh, flight have some different rules um, and they are summarized in this slide that, that I won't really speak to, but uh, just so you are aware, there's different rules for commercial flight. Um, so this is a fun slide that also showcases the shall we say, interface between artificial intelligence, machine learning, control systems with drones. So there's a fun TED Talk YouTube video here. Possibly I'll return at the end, but I'm going to skip it for now because I don't want to fumble around too much with my screens. Uh, but I have the link here and I think these talks are going to be recorded so you can go back. But basically, if you watch the video, this drone has a machine vision system. And so it is programmed to follow whoever is wearing these cool looking sunglasses. So um, Professor Ferrari here is going to put on these sunglasses and wave at the drone and then go take a little walk around the stage and you can watch that drone follow her. And it is following her not because there's someone with a little remote control, you know, following her, but, but in a truly automated manner using machine vision. And so that's a pretty interesting um, development, I think. So now we're gonna switch gears uh, and talk more as to the type of work we do in my research group um, and others as well around the country and around the world. 
um, where we are using these drones to get some exciting new capabilities um, for atmospheric and environmental measurements. And to be more specific, what we are um, studying in this case is atmospheric methane. So methane um, is the molecule CH4. Methane is naturally present with some um, concentration, roughly 1800 parts per billion in the atmosphere. Um, methane is also a potent greenhouse gas. That means that it causes climate change. So I'm sure all of you, um, if you listen to the news even a little bit, are hearing a lot about these issues, right? The big fires we're having in Colorado and California are being blamed in part on climate change. There's also a lot of concern about the natural gas industry, which is aiming to provide clean energy, releasing methane into the atmosphere and therefore inadvertently also contributing to climate change. Uh, the specific topic of methane emissions was even mentioned um, in the first presidential debate as an example. So this is really something that is very much um, at the forefront in terms of um, important societal problems where engineering can really help. So that's a, a bit of a preamble on the importance of methane in the atmosphere. And we really want to develop ways to measure the methane in the atmosphere that comes from the oil and gas industry. So I should probably be clear that when people talk about natural gas, which you know, we use um, for heating homes and for a lot of energy uses in some transportation applications now, when people say natural gas, that's basically 90% um, or so methane. So we can use those terms a bit interchangeably. So the point is that the natural gas industry has all sorts of equipment like wells that pulls the natural gas out of the ground. And that equipment um, has some leakage or some emissions associated with it. And because those emissions basically contribute to climate change, as well as actually being a lost product like dollars going up into the air, it's very important to have tools to help that industry understand their emissions. And that is really the focus um, of the work I'm going to show you now. So there's a few pictures here of some wells. You can see this map here. This is a few years old, but even in 2013, we had some 14,000 or so wells in Northern Colorado. That number is more like double that now. And so it's, it requires a scalable solution to figure out if we have 30,000 wells, how much are they um, emitting of this methane gas? And so what we would like to do is to use what we refer to as mobile platforms, meaning trucks and drones, and then to drive and fly them around this type of equipment, and then to have some appropriate sensors that can measure the amount of methane and to use this as a scalable way to address this problem. And so to give you a little more context, the way that this is done now, more or less, is to send an expensive team of two or three dedicated scientists to go visit each of these pieces of equipment, and they might sit there for half a day and make some detailed measurements. And while there's most definitely a role for that, that is not a scalable approach to measure these tens of thousands of pieces of equipment. So we want to do something where we can visit one of them in five minutes and then go to the next one for five minutes and so on. So um, an important ingredient here, of course, is that we need a piece of equipment, a sensor that can measure that methane. So my group does quite a lot with laser sensors and I'm, I'm not gonna get into the details of this sensor. Um, basically the methane molecule, CH4, shown here in the top left, absorbs light at certain wavelengths, like in the near infrared, abbreviated here as NIR. And so without going into all the bells and whistles, this is a laser sensor that uses a laser of that wavelength I just referred to and basically shines it through a little length, roughly one meter long, or actually a bit less than that, 60 centimeters long, and measures how much methane is there along this line. So what we have 
first done is to put that sensor on a truck. And, and you can see a picture of that here. So this little unit on the roof is that sensor. These two um, white um, little cone type things sticking up on the air are actually wireless cellular antennas. So when we drive this truck around, it automatically, um, like a cell phone, sends the readings from the methane sensor to a computational cloud where we can analyze it. So we don't need to go and you know, pull out little disk drives or memory sticks or whatever. Um, and this equipment also has a GPS. So as well as sending the methane readings, it sends the locations. So we've driven it on the truck and I'm also going to show you how we use it on these drones. So to give you a flavor of what this looks like in the field, um, here is an example where we have driven the truck with the methane sensor past some oil and gas infrastructure. So these little um, color-coded and um, vertically stacked symbols you see here is the amount of methane. Um, the path is the truck driving back and forth several times. And this broken yellow perimeter is showing the outline of a natural gas facility. And this red arrow is the wind. And so what is happening here is that methane is getting emitted from this equipment. The wind um, carries it. So this is a lot like a, a smokestack that you might see um, from a factory where you can see this white plume in the air, except now it's invisible to the eye. But the point is that as the sensor drives through and intersects that methane plume or methane cloud, we get these elevated readings. So um, doing this on, on the truck certainly has a role. Um, but if we could do it with a drone, that would be pretty exciting too. We might get um, a more efficient way to sample more locations. We might be able to better visit locations that don't have road access and so on. Um, and so other companies and other universities are doing this as well. So this is actually a magazine article, Drones Spot Gas Leaks from the Sky. And um, this is actually work from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, you know, that does a lot of um, space flight and so on in Pasadena, California. Um, where they have a little methane sensor, the hardware shown in yellow and, and flying it around on a quadcopter drone. Um, another picture of similar. And so we uh, in my research group are, are doing similar activity to see what type of solution we can um, develop. And so we've looked at both fixed wing and the rotary drones. And so there are some trade-offs of each of these summarized here. So to give a few quick examples, the rotary drone is very safe and easy to pilot, um, easy to fly and control. Um, but some downsides are that it tends to have shorter flight times. Um, and as I'll show you in a second, um, and what this red arrow is indicating, is that the fixed wing uh, UABs have a simpler flow field around them. And, and I'll speak to that in a second. Uh, this, by the way, what I'm showing you is a report um, developed by some of the government agencies that do atmospheric research where they considered um, these benefits and drawbacks. This is another slide from that report, and I just want to remind you here um, this huge variation in the candidate drones. So, for example, there are some drones that are less than 50 pounds, which is this red line, those are ones that um, you can fly without any special license. But we're also reminding you that you could use that um, Predator or Global Hawk we looked at earlier uh, and fly you know, at, at 45,000 feet. But now you have a 6,000 pound drone that's probably not um, the scale that one would use at a university and so on. So I mentioned this idea of the flow field induced by the drone and, and this is showcased here. And these are very similar considerations actually to what you have with a helicopter. So if you picture standing uh, below a landing helicopter, you are going to feel a tremendous what is called downwash. The rotors are sucking the air down. And that is um, what I'm highlighting with these red arrows and the sense of this flow field coming down. And so the point is that if I'm flying this drone around to sample the atmosphere, but I'm also changing the flow of that atmosphere. I'm basically creating some new winds, if you like, 
then I need to at least account for that in my analysis. People have done experiments to try to calculate those flow fields um, where they put drones inside of wind tunnels, and this is an example of that. So let's switch now and, and show you what it looks like when we've done some of this work. So this is um, a student team that, that we had here at Mechanical Engineering, CSU. So they took that drone, that sensor, excuse me, you can see the, um, the white end caps here, and then they integrated it to a Matrice 600 Pro. Um, and this, by the way, is done with our CSU Drone Center. So CSU has a campus-wide drone center to support this type of activity. They also, in fact, give little um, courses to train students to, to fly these drones. So here you see the drone um, going up. This drone has six rotors. The sensor weighs 10 pounds in this case. Um, we can do flights of approximately 15 minutes. And then um, when we reach the end of the flight, you can see the drone landing. These flight paths can be um, handled in an automated way. And so it's really quite straightforward to do this type of piloting, much more so as compared to with a fixed wing, more airplane style drone. Um, we refer to the data we obtain as 4D data because it evolves in both space and time. So let me pause this for a second, actually. So what you're looking at here is the ground. So this is um, like an X, Y axis in unit of meters along the ground. So sort of like one football field this way, two football fields this way, and then half a football field 40 meters up. And the little dots are the methane readings. So you'll see some lines back and forth on the ground. And so this is a truck driving back and forth on the ground. And then the dots in the air are the dots that we measure with the flying drone. And the little arrows down there are the wind. And so again, the idea, um, basically the interpretation here, um, well, the wind has actually moved over the course of the measurement, but for a while the wind was this direction. And so there are elevated methane readings here. And then a bit later, the wind was this direction and there are elevated readings there. Um, this slide shows that by combining um, these flight path methane readings with the wind, we can quite accurately tell you how much methane was actually emitted. So there's two comparisons where we were off by 12% and 28%. Uh, but that's actually pretty good for this type of work. And then I wanted to show you that we've done some similar stuff with the fixed wing. Um, so we have a 12 foot telemaster drone. Um, here is a picture of someone else flying it, dropping candy actually to um, an event with kids below. This drone is somewhere in between a sort of toy hobbyist remote control plane and a research grade UAV, if you see what I mean. Um, but Jared and, and Colin, two of our um, recent talented undergraduate students, integrated the methane sensor as well actually as ammonia sensor to this um, vehicle and um, did some flights with it. And so here we see them actually at the Loveland Remote Control um, Aircraft Club um, taking off and doing a flight with this drone and the sensors are under the two wings and we can make those types of readings. And here is an example of methane concentration and ammonia concentration versus time as recorded from that fixed wing um, aircraft. So I think I'm getting a bit towards the end of my time. I'm just gonna spend about two minutes to quickly showcase another project. And this one is fun because this was one of our senior design teams. So this is a team of senior year, final year undergraduate students. They were sponsored by an industrial company, Alden, and the job of their project was to measure temperatures of thermal discharge from power plants. So coal generating power plants in general discharge some um, process water, heated water into little lakes, rivers, etc. And it's important to understand how much they're heating up those lakes, rivers, et cetera, basically to avoid killing all the fish, to explain it real short. Um, and so the team developed a drone that would fly around 
and drop this little probe that's going to retract downwards into the water. Um, there was a little safety disconnect in case that probe got stuck somehow so that the drone could still fly away. They learned how to use these automated flight controllers where they could set some specific GPS type locations and then the drone sequentially navigates to them. And then this is fun. Um, what's better than one drone? Well, better than one drone is two drones. And so what you see here actually is one drone up in the air filming the second drone. And this second drone um, is the one that um, is carrying this probe I described to you. So it's going to drop um, the end of this long tether uh, into these little lakes that it's studying. And we did that at the Rawhide Power Plant. And this is a plot of the temperature of the water versus the depth of the water. And so they showed they could make those types of measurements. So I would like to just acknowledge several graduate students listed here and undergraduate students who have helped with the laser sensors um, with flying these drones and UABs, as well as um, um, funding support. So um, that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And as much time uh, as we have, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azair. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can just unmute and speak up. Or if you'd prefer to put it in chat, then I can um, ask those questions for you. Go ahead, please. Don't be shy. I'm happy to talk about any aspect of it, even things that you might think are a little unimportant or silly, whatever. Just please uh, feel free to ask anything you like. We have a question about my virtual background. Um, I wish I could tell you that was a, a drone I have flown in or a spacecraft I have flown in, uh, but this is just a, a generic spaceship image that is more exciting than my regular office. Okay, well, look, thank you everyone. Um, it seems there are no questions, which is okay. So um, Ellen, maybe we should move along or actually I see one question here. So uh, do undergraduate students who get to work on these projects need any specific background? Uh, so good question. There, there's probably two answers to that question. So a lot of um, professors um, engage undergraduate students in paid or unpaid positions to work in their labs. And so in that case, you know, the professors of course have um, discretion to look for different backgrounds in students, but I would say many professors are open to students who are generally um, showing themselves to be enterprising and dedicated and interested to learn, even if they don't have specific backgrounds. So I take many students who join laser projects in my group and really do not have any background in lasers, and, and then we try to, of course, learn that along the way. And the same is, is true for the UAB work. Um, one of the students here, actually, Jared, is an amateur pilot and remote control plane enthusiast on his own, which was, was pretty cool. And, and so if people have that kind of background, that's great. Um, but we certainly also, in this um, senior design program as well, uh, which we call our uh, senior practicum, I guess, excuse me, MEC 486, um, we, we take students with all backgrounds. And then as we structure the teams, we might shift them into roles based on their background, but we try to be pretty, um, um, how should I say it, broad in terms of the students we bring on. Uh, I see a question here as well. In what year do undergraduates start working in research? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think there's no single answer to that question. And so I, I would say that is largely up to the undergraduates themselves. Um, I would say, and I think a lot of the professors would agree that, that making an effort to get involved in research is hugely valuable. Even if you don't necessarily continue to graduate school, if you get involved in some research, 
it will give you very um, useful engineering hands-on experience. It will also give you something very useful to point at in your CV, your resume, um, to differentiate yourself when you're applying for jobs, basically. So picture there's going to be a lot of students realistically graduating from mechanical engineering, maybe with pretty similar, you know, 3.4 GPA, whatever it is. So how do you set yourself apart? Well, if you can show a little portfolio of projects you've participated in, things you've designed and built and analyzed and so on, um, then in my opinion, um, hirers and recruiters would really value that. So I encourage you to get involved. Um, we have these design type courses along the way where you are <laughs> kind of essentially inherently getting involved in research. But, but in addition to that, to try to make connections with individual professors and join their research groups is very valuable. And um, this is an example where as, as students, you should really just show that initiative yourself, you know, don't be shy, send emails, knock on doors and, and try to build those connections. There's no um, recipe for, for how that goes. So sorry, that was a bit of a long answer and uh, time may be evolving here. Um, Anthony, or excuse me, Professor Marchese, excuse me, is, um, is writing some stuff into the chat as well that, um, that, that please take a look at or possibly he will speak to. Uh, so Ellen, this is great, but I have a feeling for time reasons, we should um, probably move on from me. Thank you yes. again, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yalen. I see that Dr. Williams has, uh, he's got his video up and I think he is ready to present also. Dr. Williams, wanna go ahead? All right, thanks, Ellen. Um, I'm of course not ready. I have no idea how to do Zoom and I'm gonna try to see if I can share my screen. I'm going to share screen one. And then I'm going to go to presentation mode. And John, we do see your presentation. So now, do you see it the whole screen? No, we don't. There you go. Now you're in the right mode. All right. OK, everyone. Uh, Thank you for calling in. And we used to do this in person back in normal days, but this is the new way of doing some stuff until maybe a few more months go by or maybe even a year. But um, anyway, I was hoping that if everybody would come off mic whenever they wanted and ask a question, sometimes I, I, I kind of drone on. And so if you have any question, anything that comes up into your mind, just stop me. I was gonna talk about advanced propulsion and I might mention that Azair Yalan is heavily involved in advanced propulsion as well, and he mostly talked about other things today. Um, but they, there's uses for lasers in, in this field as well, as you can imagine. So first off, I guess what I wanted to talk about is what is propulsion? Because if we, when you want to understand what advanced propulsion is, you have to kind of understand what, what, it, what, is, what does it mean to you know, push something around. And we mostly are talking about pushing stuff around in space um, in, in the advanced propulsion world, but you can think about just standing on some roller blades <clears throat> and taking a bowling ball and just throwing the bowling ball. And um, when you throw the bowling ball, of course, your hand is putting force on the bowling ball. And if you integrated that force over time, uh, when it left your hand, you would have given it an impulse. It's called, a, it's measured in Newton seconds. And then that impulse would be delivered in an equal and opposite way to you and you would start rolling backwards in the other direction on your, your rollerblades there. When uh, um, the, you know, and then your mass times your velocity <clears throat> would be <clears throat> equal to that momentum. And uh, you, you know, could, is that like propulsion? Well, it's just kind of like a single event, right? But you could put a backpack of, of bowling balls, uh, you know, in, on, and carry it in a, you know, with you, and then you could basically fling one bowling ball after another. And every time you throw one, you give yourself an impulse. And so you could change your velocity. And that's what we're really doing in space when we move satellites around as we fire thrusters, propulsion devices, and, and move satellites around to different orbits. 
um, this particular technique isn't very uh, effective. And I want to know, I want somebody to come off mic and say, like one way in which we could make this a more effective propulsion system. So, and I'll just arbitrarily pick somebody if nobody comes off mic. Well, it looks like uh, the roller blades are dug into the ground and not flat against the surface. So that seems like he's not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's got his brakes on. So I was intending that that was just for drama, <laughs> the position of his blades, but assume that they're perfectly in contact with the ground and then, and that they're able to roll with zero friction and you're on a, you know, in a zero friction surface. So what, what, would, what would you say we could do to make this a better propulsion system? Since you if there was a if there's an increase in the mass of that bowling ball, if it could theoretically be carried, that would increase the force and also increase the force in the opposite direction. Yeah, the impulse. So yeah, so if you increase the mass and then you could still throw it at the same velocity, but what about doing the opposite thing and throwing the same size cannonball faster? So it's this it's this idea. <clears throat> of the impulse, we talked about it as the force integrated over time that the hand is on the cannonball, but then what ends up happening is, I keep saying cannonball, sorry, bowling ball. When the bowling ball leaves, it has a, it has a certain mass and a certain velocity. And when you multiply those two together, that's kind of like what we're talking about in terms of this impulse. And that happens to deliver an equal and opposite impulse to the person that's flinging these bowling balls, right? So one of the, the things is so we could take those bowling balls, melt them down or file them down or break them down into little marbles, right? And we could shoot them off a little tiny mass at the same velocity. And of course, you know, you're, you're on your rollerblades, you wouldn't even feel it, right? But what we could do is we, if we could take some kind of a, a you know, marble gun and shoot out that marble. So we've taken that cannonball or bowling ball and we whittled it down into a bunch of little marbles and then we shoot we're just shooting one out here the mass times the velocity is giving us the same impulse that we got from the flinging the this bowling ball off when we were talking about in the first slide so how could you build a propulsion system out of that well what if you carried i don't know can everybody see my mouse hey alan no, we sure can yeah okay. we can see Mm -hmm. So if you packed your, your marbles, for example, in this little pouch, and then you just fed them up into your marble gun, you could shoot out those guys one after the other. And you could actually, by shooting three marbles, for example, you could get the same impulse delivered to this person as if you shot out three bowling balls or if you threw out three bowling balls. And so, you, you know, you saw that big backpack that this guy had on in the first propulsion system, and now he's got this tiny little backpack and so what so somebody else has to come off mic and say what's the kind of like the smallest thing that you can think of um that would uh, you know that we could because we can like what could we whittle down these marbles down to what's something really small that would be a cool thing to try a quark yeah <laughs> you know it used to be uh, noah back in the day um you guys were like all the all the there this all the um, potential folks coming to college were like me and we, we knew about like Adams, like my high school, we taught us about Adams, but now you guys are so advanced, you know, about all these different sub atomic particles, <laughs> but I was hoping somebody would have just said Adams, you know, because that's kind of, that's small enough for this type of technology. And so we can do better. We can go to smaller size particles, but we usually just go with Adams and we put them inside these devices that we call electric propulsion thrusters, sometimes just thrusters. And we have a device inside these things that fires out electrons that when it smacks atoms with an electron, it can liberate an electron and form an ion. And if we hold that whole cavity at positive potentials, then when one of these ions comes near these grids and sees a negatively biased grid, it will zip out at very high velocity. So it's just like that marble um, gun that we were talking about earlier, but it's shooting ions instead of 
little um, you know marbles. And so by shooting these little atoms out at extremely high velocities, we can use extremely little amount of propellant to do a mission in, on orbit. And so that that so what you guys just heard these series of slides have probably insulted all your intelligence, but you just kind of have now an intuitive feeling of of what advanced propulsion is and why it's important. Um, so the, you know, like everybody understands that atoms are neutral. And um, so two xenon atoms kind of end up walking into a bar and, uh, and they have, I don't know if you guys know this, but xenon atoms have about 56 electrons hanging around them. And, you know, they're kind of, and they're kind of messy, shaggy looking dudes, and it's kind of a biker bar. And one of the, um, you know, one of the xenon atoms looks at one of the other xenon atoms and says, you know what, I think I lost one of my electrons. And the other xenon atom says, you know, are you sure? And he says, yeah, I'm positive. Now, everybody has to come off mic to laugh. Snicker, snicker. That was a pretty good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, that's the only joke we have in electric propulsion. And, and every single time we talk about this stuff, we, we repeat that joke. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, this is kind of what they look like when they're operating they, these ion thrusters. I'm going to talk also about hall thrusters for a short time during this um, kind of lecture. I, I was trying to think of a way in which I could get everybody to participate and talk about these things. This particular thruster uh, is a smaller device, about 400 watts. It's shooting out xenon ions at about 45,000 meters per second. So roughly here to Denver in a couple of seconds. And, um, and then uh, when we knock those electrons off of atoms inside and shoot them out of this thing, we have to have a way of neutralizing the positive charge. If we just shot positive charge off of a spacecraft, it would charge negative and then the ions would come back around and collect on the spacecraft and it would, we wouldn't get any thrust produced and we would be like trying to pick yourself up off the ground if you grabbed your bootstraps or your shoes or your toe, uh, shoelaces and tried to lift yourself up the ground <clears throat> by pulling on your shoes. So in order to prevent that, the electron that we knocked off the atoms inside here, we flow through power supplies that are used to put the biases on these things. And then we boil the electrons off these things called neutralizers, and then the electrons leave with the ions. The same electron that we knock off the atom inside leaves through the neutralizer and goes out away from the spacecraft. And so in this way, we could neutralize a positively charged beam that's being shot off of a spacecraft. Okay, so I'm going to shut up for a minute. Anybody have any questions? All right. So you know, that, that was a smaller thruster. These thrusters have been built, you know, they've been built all the way up to 25 kilowatts. The, the ones that are being used commercially are around the four to five kilowatt range. That's the amount of power that they utilize. And they're running at about a thousand volts. So it means that the number of amps of ions that they're emitting uh, from, the, from the ion thruster is on the order of four to five amps. And, and this is a satellite, uh, the, the Boeing Space Systems 702. And then there's actually a designation on the end of this called HP. It stands for high power, but the customers of Boeing always say that that stands for high price. Um, it means really does mean high power. These are solar cells here and they even have reflectors on them that reflect solar light onto the solar panels. These are gallium arsenide cells and they can run a little bit hotter than standard solar cells. And they produce up, upwards of you know, 20 kilowatts on these satellites. And they use these satellites to broadcast radio waves down to the Earth and so that everybody can have you know, constant radio station coverage over the entire US with you know, whatever, 200 channels of radio. Um, the, these satellites uh, orbit the Earth in what's called geosynchronous communication orbit, which it's basically about 6.6 .6 Earth radii away from the center of the Earth. And the time that they take to go around the Earth is exactly the same time it takes for the Earth to spin on its axis. So they kind of hang out in a stationary position. And then when you're, um, they're hanging out kind of like above the United States, for example, in this case, and then they're just broadcasting continuous information back down onto the Earth. 
Um, there's a bunch of different types of geosynchronous communication satellites, but this particular one, the reason I'm bringing it up is it has four ion thrusters on it. There's one ion thruster right here, one at this location, and then you can see the shadows of the other two right here. They're, they're actually at this location. They're typically on the side of the satellite away from the Earth. They call it the nadir side. And then there's uh, other structures on the, on the satellites that you know, we could go into more detail if you guys want. But these thrusters, what's cool about them is they can gimbal and they're used to basically bring the satellite all the way out to geosynchronous orbit. So they call that orbit raising. And then they also keep the satellite in position. So sometimes, depending on where the moon is and where the Earth is in its orbit, where the Earth is tilted with respect to it, its orbital plane with respect to the sun, that these satellites can get pulled out of orbit uh, slightly. And so we have to keep station keeping them to keep them in the proper location. And we use these advanced propulsion systems to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna shut up in case there's any questions. Oh, okay, and hey, Alan, is my mic coming across okay? Yeah, very good, John, thank you. All right. Do you, do you see the question from Mitchell? Oh my gosh. No, I do not. Can you read? All right. He, Mitchell says, how viable is ion thrust for deep space missions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm focusing, I didn't have time to talk to you about everything, but NASA recently completed, it was a couple of years ago, uh, completed a mission that where they used uh, ion propulsion to rendezvous with two asteroids in the asteroid belt. It was a very cool mission. It was called Dawn, if anybody wants to look it up, D-A-W-N. And it was meant to investigate Vesta, which is kind of um, uh, one of the largest asteroid, the second largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. But it's kind of a very old um, and um, it, it, it's been beat up quite a bit, like it's been hit with other by other asteroids and, and it's, it's quite uh, structured and, and deformed. Uh, and then, in a, but it's te technically classified as an asteroid. And then Ceres was the other asteroid that we visited, uh, that NASA visited. This was the first time that any, that any satellite ever rendezvoused with two different space objects. And uh, it, it basically went to these asteroids, spiraled down very close to them, took some very detailed pictures. It was amazing. And then it spiraled back out away from the asteroid and then moved to the next asteroid, Ceres and then spiraled back down again. And really cool pictures of series were, were obtained in movies and so forth. So I'd encourage anybody to look that up if, if you're interested. They used thrusters that were a little bit, not about the same size as these thrusters, but they were operated in the, really the, like the 1.4 kilowatt to, you know, maybe down to in the 400 watt range. So NASA, one of the things that they like to do is throttle their thrusters. And because when you get further away from the sun, you don't receive as much solar energy, their thrusters need to be able to operate over wide power ranges. And they had three NSTAR, they called the engines, the ion thrusters on that mission. They had three of them on the satellite. And they basically, they were doing great. They could have kept the mission going, but the, the Dawn satellite also used some hydrazine a propellant and some regular um, uh, standard gas thrusters and they ran out of hydrazine so that they then they ended up stopping the mission. So that mission launched in 2007 and it finished up in I think 2017 or so. It lasted for about 10 years and uh, it was it was you know just a really cool good question. Um, Hey, John, so, we've got another one. Um, this one's from Jenna, and she says, what materials do ion thrusters take in and use? Yeah, so the propellant, that's a really good question. Um, this, the propellant that's used on, on the Dawn mission, for example, and in all the geosynchronous communication satellite ion propulsion systems is xenon, and it's an inert gas, uh, and it's stored in fairly large tanks at high pressure. And then there's a propellant feed system that delivers a relatively small amount of gas to the thruster. You'd be surprised at how little gas is needed overall. That's the whole point of using advanced propulsion. But then the amount of gas that you use in each burn, some of the burns last for a couple hours when you're doing station keeping. 
and there's only if you guys held your fingers up into a kind of a, a hollow um, cube, you know, like a one cubic centimeter, these thrusters run probably on at, at the order of 10 to 30 standard cubic centimeters per minute of gas, which is works out to be an incredibly small amount of mass flow rate, typically measured in the micro kilograms per second range. Okay, so um, these are, this is a vacuum facility on Earth that we use to test these thrusters before we put them on satellites. And so inside the chamber, there's a thruster in this location. It's firing at a, a target that's at this other location. And then these, these chambers, you have to pump the gas out as fast as you're putting it in. So we're running on xenon. And so these 48 inch diameter cryo tubs here, these chambers are about 20 feet by 40 feet. And then these cryo tubs are about 48 inches in diameter. And inside there is a surface that's held at about 12 to 14 degrees Kelvin, which is very cold, that's covered in activated charcoal. And any time a xenon atom come near, comes near that surface or anything else that's inside the vacuum chamber, it will freeze out and so get pumped. And so as much propellant as you're pumping through the thruster and firing, into the vacuum chamber gets pumped out just as quickly on these pumps and we can maintain a very low pressure inside the chamber simulating outer space and then doing a good job of, of getting the true lifetime of the thruster, for example, or its performance. Because you want to be able to test and measure everything before you put it on a satellite. And so, again, mechanical engineers, if we want to talk about what mechanical engineers would do on a project like this, the PhDs in mechanical engineering work on the thruster uh, they work on, you know, kind of all the material science involved with the thruster. They work on uh, all of the instrumentation that's related to how the thruster is performing. And they work with electrical engineers on a lot of the test consoles that are used to drive the thruster. Of course, mechanical engineers build all the propellant feed systems. And in addition, all of the, the pumps that are on this vacuum chamber and all the fabrication techniques for the vacuum chambers are all done by mechanical engineers. And then everything that's laid out inside the building is, of course, done by mechanical engineers because the all the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is done. And mechanical engineering, you know, I mean, I'm I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm maybe quite biased, but it's one of those super useful fields that you can move between many different areas in. And I'm always, if somebody's uncertain about what field to go into, I always encourage them to go into mechanical engineering. And then they could decide if they really want to specialize, maybe they could go get a master's degree in aerospace engineering or a master's degree in uh, maybe even electrical engineering or computer engineering or something that, that, has, that has their interest, but they would have this broad background at first and wide skill base that they would get from going through the mechanical engineering program. Hey, okay. John, another, we have another quick question from Jenna, please. Okay. Um, do, do satellites run out of fuel and what's done when they do? Yeah, so I, that's a perfect question for the chart that's up right now. All of the satellites that are shown here, and this is an old chart. I'm gonna, the reason I'm showing this chart is I wanna follow it up with another one. But every one of these satellites that's being used in geosynchronous orbit that I'm showing here, for example, will eventually run out of propellant. Typically, we design them to run for, to, to be in orbit for around 12 to 15 years. And then at that point, they run out of propellant and they can't maintain their position anymore. And we usually reserve a small amount of propellant and we bring them out further away from the earth in what's called a parking orbit. And it's basically, um, and then we switch them off and they're far enough away from the other satellites that they would never interact with them and so forth. But there's kind of basically a, a lot of junk building up in space. Out at geosynchronous communication orbit distances, there's quite a bit of room. So there's really no concern. But when you get in closer to the earth, when satellites run out of propellant, they no longer can maneuver, that's kind of dangerous because they could have collisions and we could create a debris cloud around the earth in that case. And so a lot of folks that are building constellations right now are using advanced propulsion on these systems to deorbit their systems after the end of life. So they save a little bit of propellant and then deorbit. But your to answer your question is they're, they're useless once they've used all their propellant up. And then you, if you think back about mechanical engineers, mechanical engineers are, are basically tasked with anything related to transportation. And so that's why mechanical engineers seem to 
be involved so much in spacecraft propulsion is because it's the it's the part of the satellite business that has to do with making things happen, moving stuff. John, quick question from Eric. Are we able to monitor where the debris is in space? Yeah, so we have radar systems that are on the Earth that monitor all the different pieces of, we call it, you know, space junk. Um, space junk can range from very heavy things, like um, there's these adapter rings that um, folks use on launch vehicles to load the primary payload onto, and then they do the secondary payload, they usually will mount below this uh, adapter ring. And then when they go into orbit, they release the one satellite and it does its, goes into its orbit and does its job. And then they start releasing what are called secondary payloads. These could be smaller satellites that, um, that folks wanted to like piggyback ride onto this launch vehicle, or they could be CubeSats and all kinds of other things. And those, um, those adapter rings are just left in orbit and they've been floating around the earth since the you know, 1970s. And so there's some discussion of building systems that would go and get that debris and bring it into kind of a, a, a dedicated orbit and build kind of a junkyard of sorts. And then folks are thinking about going there into those junkyards and then figuring out how to build manufacturing plants for other satellites from the, from the, the used satellites that are already in orbit. Okay, so how much time do we have? So you need to wrap it up pretty quickly. When when do we when we stop right at two for me? No, it's one fifty five. But <laughs> that's okay because we have a little extra buffer at the end. So just keep going, John. You're doing good. Oh well, I think I'm already taking too much time. So what could electric propulsion do for deep space missions? And we talked a little bit about Dawn. This is a kind of a concept called JIMO, and it's the Jupiter Icy Moon Tour. And I don't know if you all know about. Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa. Um, these worlds are believed to have oceans on them and there may be life in these uh, oceans. And so there's some interest in going and learning more about these things. And kind of like how we rendezvoused about around some asteroids in the asteroid belt, it might be cool to go around the moons of Jupiter and do the same sort of thing. And you know, how would we do that? Well, we're so far away from our sun that we couldn't use solar cells. And so maybe what we do is power this vehicle with a nuclear reactor and in order to, we, and then we would, for example, heat water to steam, run it through some turbo machinery. We would have to reject the waste heat, just like Azair Yalan talked about in a river, but we don't have rivers out in space. So we'd need to use a radiator to radiate our waste heat away. And then what we would do is provide the power that the nuclear reactor produced and turned into electrical power to our electric propulsion devices. So we might have, see this might have 10, 25 kilowatt ion thrusters that push this satellite around. And what's really interesting about this is right now, the largest Delta V that we've ever done as humanity in space has been around 11,000 meters per second um, or 11 kilometers per second. And that was the Dawn mission. And so this mission would take almost four times that uh, to get done. And, it, you know, I think this sounds far, far fetched, but, you know, it, this is kind of like where advanced propulsion is going and what it en enables us to do. Okay, so I, I'm really, unless I'm not out of time, I, I, I maybe just need to take some questions and then, and then let, um, I think Azari Allen's up next. I mean, sorry, um, Anthony Marchese's up next. Yeah, that's correct. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, here we go. Here's a question. Can you use electric propulsion to launch a vehicle into low earth orbit from the surface of the earth? Unfortunately, no. These types of propulsion systems require to be operated in the vacuum of space or the, in the vacuum that we create inside vacuum chambers, for example, at the ERC, at Engineering Research Center at CSU. And so you cannot, and they don't also produce enough thrust to overcome the effect of gravity like chemical rockets do. So we use regular chemical rockets to get into orbit, and then we turn on these advanced devices to move around in orbit once we are already in orbit. Any other questions? Yes, um, this is from Mitchell. He says, how does a radiator work in space if there's no air to pass over the fins and pull heat away? Yeah, good question. So you're thinking of a heat exchanger when you're thinking of something with fins and typically 
if we have an, a heat exchanger that has some fluid on the inside that's hot and we want to cool it with air, we put fins on tubes, we flow the water through the tubes, and then we blow air over the fins, right? That's kind of like how your, your car works. A radiator just is anything that, that gets rid of heat. And uh, as just, you know, as you probably know, if you have a, an electric uh, stovetop at home, you can turn it on and when it starts to glow red, you could set your hand, you know, nearby it above it and feel the heat coming off. There's radiation that's occurring off that surface. And so the same thing would happen off of a surface in space. And because the background space temperature is only four degrees Kelvin, it's very easy to radiate heat away from objects. With that said, the radios still are very large compared to the overall power, you know, system. Great, All thank right. you very much, John. I think we should probably pass it over to Dr. Marchese. Okay, great. Sorry for going so slow, but if anybody no, has any no. questions. No, no, good job, thank you. Yeah, okay, bye-bye. Good job, John, thank you. Um, so let me share, uh, share, and I'm gonna share my entire screen to start. Are you seeing my entire, well, you know, this always happens. I have a bunch of things open because I'm multitasking. Um, so uh, are you seeing, everybody seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Excellent. So um, yeah, full disclosure, I was the one that asked Professor Williams about uh, whether you can use electrical propulsion to launch a vehicle from the surface of the earth. And uh, it was a, a shameless plug uh, to the next topic, which is chemical rocket propulsion. And so most of the rockets that most people are familiar with are uh, rockets that use chemical rocket propulsion. And that's what we really need to produce the high thrust in order to launch vehicles into space. So um, I've been teaching a class called chemical rocket propulsion for, for many years that really focuses on, on those types of rockets. And I just wanted to show you, this is the, the kind of the course website uh, that uh, really goes into all the topics of the course. But the thing that uh, students get most excited about in this particular class is that we actually, in addition to learning all the theory behind rocket propulsion, uh, we actually have each student design and build a, uh, their own hybrid rocket motor. And, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today is the hybrid rocket motor design project. Um, so let me share the presentation here. Uh, let's see, new share. So I need to share somehow my presentation. Where is that? Oh, it's here, I think. Yep, uh, is that right? No, nope, that's not it. Where is my PowerPoint presentation? Da -da 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 -da. There it is. Okay. Okay, Anthony, we can see it. You're good to go. Fantastic. So thanks again, everybody. So I already showed you the course website. And uh, so these are just the objectives of the chemical rocket propulsion course. I won't go to them in a lot of detail, but the uh, you know, first uh, objectives are you know, to really learn the theory behind rocket propulsion. And then as engineers, we really wanna uh, focus on design. So we talk about and teach how to design a liquid rocket engines and how to design uh, solid uh, rocket motors. And then lastly, how to design uh, hybrid rocket motors. And then the real fun in the class is that each student in the class designs and builds a 10 pound thrust hybrid rocket motor. And that's what I want to talk about today is just that design project. Um, so the motivation behind this project years ago uh, and becoming even more relevant today, uh, all the way back in 2004, uh, Spaceship One uh, became the first private spa uh, manned spacecraft uh, to actually get into, into um, space, at 300, uh, altitude of 328,000 feet. And they use a hybrid rocket motor. And what a hybrid rocket motor is, it uses a liquid propellant and a solid fuel. Um, and so it's actually one of the easiest and most fun rockets to build uh, on your own. And so I decided, well, wouldn't it be cool in our rocket propulsion class to have each one of our students design and build a hybrid rocket motor? 
So that's what we do. Um, so about two thirds of the way through the class, we start the project and, and uh, the objectives are that each student is gonna design, build and test their own hybrid rocket motor. But the first thing is we develop a theoretical model that actually predicts all the performance. And I'll show you some of the equations. And, and what I tell the students is, you know, at the end of this class, they can all call themselves rocket scientists because they can actually predict the performance of this rocket. Um, and then we do the test and we compare it to the, to the, to the uh, experiments. We have a couple of constraints. So each team has to, uh, we use gaseous oxidizer, uh, oxygen as the oxidizer. Um, I, I restrict them on the, the maximum chamber pressure because we want to, you know, we want, want this thing to blow up. Um, and they have to generate a minimum of five pounds thrust uh, under all of these constraints. Now, the fun thing about hybrid rocket motors, particularly if we use 100% oxygen as the oxidizer, is that students can use just about any fuel that they want, as long as it has carb carbon and hydrogen atoms in it, it will work. And so we use some fancy propellants like HTPB, which stands for hydroxy terminated polybutadiene. Um, but we have even had students uh, uh, make fuels out of wax or even animal fat and I even had a team use a salami once and it worked. Um, okay, so this is what you will learn, okay? These are all of the equations that uh, we derive in class. And at the end of class, students can call themselves rocket scientists. Uh, this is really all of the physics on how a hybrid rocket motor works. I mean, we inject a liquid or gaseous oxidizer uh, that burns along with the, the fuel, which causes a surface regression rate what creates a mass flow rate of fuel that combines with a mass flow rate of oxidizer. Um, and ultimately we, we uh, push that through a nozzle and create supersonic flow out the uh, back end of the nozzle to create thrust. Um, and the overall thrust that we create comes from this equation, mass flow rate times these other fancy parameters, C star and thrust coefficient. Um, and the C star, really is a measure of the energetic performance of the propellants there. So we actually then uh, go to another process using a sophisticated, it used to be sophisticated, now it's pretty routine, uh, NASA chemical equilibrium code, which allows the students to actually uh, predict the energetic performance uh, as a function of fuel to oxidizer ratio. And the thing about hybrid rocket motors, which is kind of cool, is that the ratio of propellant mass flow rate to oxidizer mass flow rate, it actually varies as a function of time as, as we burn up the fuel. And so the energetic performance actually varies as a function of time and the students have to kind of take that into account. Well, anyway, when the students take all that into account, they actually develop a model, predicts the pressure inside the rocket as a function of time. It predicts the thrust as a function of time and it predicts the specific impulse, which is kind of uh, a fancy term that rocket engineers use. It's kind of like the miles per gallon in your car, right? What it is, it's the amount of thrust that a rocket gets divided by the mass flow uh, of the rocket. And uh, something like electric propulsion, like the, the types of advanced propulsion that Dr. Williams was talking about, they have a specific impulse of sometimes 1,000 or even 10,000 seconds. Um, Whereas chemical rocket propulsion, the uh, highest performing chemical rocket propulsion ever developed and can ever be developed uh, would be about 400 or 450 seconds, right? So it's a factor of at least 10 or 20 worse than the best electric propulsion. Um, but anyway, our model predicts our specific impulse. Um, and then what's even more fun after doing the model, the students actually build the, the, uh, the rocket engine. And so, uh, you know, basically, uh, what do we do? We actually uh, fabricate all of our combustion chambers out of aluminum round stock in, in the machine shop. We fabricate our, um, our nozzles out of graphite because that's where it's really the highest temperature. So we build those out of graphite. And we sometimes either do that by hand on a lathe or we can also do that with our CNC turning center. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we can use pretty much any fuel that we want. So I have the students choose their own fuel and then model the performance of that fuel uh, thermodynamically and then kind of see what the results are. So this is a, a hydroxy terminated butadiene, which starts as a liquid and it kind of cures into a solid 
or we can take things like plexiglass and just machine out the center. Um, uh, or as I mentioned in the past, uh, you know, we've even used stuff like animal fat or whatever you can think of. Um, one of the other fun things about 10 years ago when we first started doing this uh, in class, I said, well, we actually need a thrust stand. We actually have to measure thrust. So we did that as a senior design project. And so, so this is our, our thrust stand uh, that we actually use to test our solid rocket motors. And um, so the objective of the senior design team was to essentially build this system uh, that can measure thrust from zero to 10 pounds, maximum chamber pressure of 250 uh, pounds per square inch and an oxidizer flow rate of 500 liters per minute. And then they kind of went to work and designed this beautiful thing that you see here. Um, uh, did all the instrumentation and what have you. Um, and uh, that's just kind of what it looks like from overhead. And that's the thrust stand itself um, and the data acquisition. So in order to do this right, we have to be able to measure chamber pressure, thrust, oxidizer mass flow rate uh, and acquire the data at uh, you know, high enough uh, sample rate because the, the burn time is only about 10 seconds. And <clears throat> that's what it looks like. So, you know, these, these thrusters, I mean, they, they're only about uh, 12 inches long, uh, but, uh, and they only generate about 10 pounds of thrust. But when we burn these things, you can hear them all the way across campus. So uh, pretty exciting. So I will try to do a movie, see how this works. Oh, before I do the movie, um, you know, it is fun to burn these things and, and watch the movies, but we are engineers and scientists. And so, you know, we wanna actually, uh, measure the thrust and the chamber pressure, for example, and compare that to our model. And so these are the actual, uh, for one particular test, I don't know what this was, it was probably HP, HTPD, um, but this is actually the measured chamber pressure as a function of time. This is the me measured thrust as a function of time. And then these two lines were the, were the predictions. And the reason they start at zero is just an artifact of the experiment. When we fire up the mass flow controller that, that uh, controls the flow rate of the oxidizer, it, it takes about two seconds for that to get up to the full scale. So you don't really need that in real life, but that's just kind of the way the experiment works. Okay, so let's see if we can watch a movie. So let's see if I, I'm gonna have to share my screen again though. So let's go back to, the, that one there. I think, well, actually what I need to do is, well, let's do that. Let me do this. Let me plow ahead. I'll show the movies at the end. Um, so, um, okay. So anyway, that's the rocket propulsion class. So we, we, we learn all the theory that we need. And one of the, the things about CSU is uh, that I think distinguishes us from a lot of engineering programs is that students who choose CSU are students who really like to roll up their sleeves and not just understand the theory, but actually build stuff. And so in addition to the rocket propulsion class for the last, I don't know what, six, seven years, we've been entering the Spaceport America Cup. And the Spaceport America Cup is where we launch big rockets. And the goal of this competition is to launch a 10,000, a 10 pound mass to either 10,000 feet or 30,000 feet, depending on what, uh, comp, what, what uh, category you choose. Um, and you can do that with a commercial off the shelf rocket motor that would look a lot like a large Estes rocket motor that you can buy. Uh, that's the way some teams do it, but that's not what CSU does. What CSU students do is they design and build the entire rocket from scratch and they don't do solid rocket motors, which are easy. They do either hybrid rocket motors, which are hard, or liquid rocket engines, which are really hard. So for the first two years of the competition, they, uh, our teams did hybrid rocket motors. So we did nitrous oxide oxidizer with hydroxy terminated polybutadiene fuel. And this is a cross section of, I think, Ares II probably, which was our second uh, team. And the very first team that time we entered the competition, we never did this before, but that year the CSU team was the, the, the only team to successfully launch and recover a hybrid rocket motor. So we did that two years in a row. Um, oh, this is a movie. Uh, so just to get an idea, this is a rocket that does not fit in the palm of your hand. This is, uh, I think from Ares II, 
which is about a 500 pound hybrid rocket motor. And to give it some scale, this is in fact uh, a, a trailer, <laughs> uh, a, a large uh, automotive size trailer. And so the, this rocket engine is about uh, four feet long. Won't be as fun without the sound, but. Uh... So that's some serious business. So that's about a 500 pound thrust for about eight seconds of burn time. Uh, so the first two years we did hybrid rocket motors again, uh, hybrid rockets uh, uh, powered by a hybrid rocket engine, uh, hybrid rocket motor. And just to give it some scale, I mean, this is about a 13 foot tall rocket. Uh, here's the team. Here's another fun thing. Sometimes we compete against teams that have like 20 or 40 students on the team. Uh, this year, the CSU team had four students, okay? Um, and yet they were the only team in the competition to successfully launch and recover a hybrid rocket motor, hybrid rocket. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, each year the students want to do something better and bigger. And so for the last three years, now four years, we do actually a liquid rocket engine. And we are the only team in the competition other than in 2018, we were one of two teams. But out of the last three years, we were the only team uh, uh, to, to actually even try a bipropellant liquid rocket. So we use liquid ethanol, which is like alcohol, and then nitrous oxide as the oxidizer. Um, and the thing about nitrous oxide is that it's sort of like uh, the propane in your propane tank from the standpoint that it, it's a two-phase uh, substance at, at uh, normal temperatures. And so the pressure in the headspace above the liquid uh, at just room temperature is about 700 pounds per square inch. So we use the pressure in the headspace above the nitrous oxide to pressurize the liquid nitrous oxide and also to pressurize the ethanol. But we have a little piston here. We don't want to have a mixture of ethanol and nitrous oxide in our fuel tanks because that would be explosive. So we have this piston that separates the nitrous gas from the ethanol. Um, and that piston pushes down and creates the pressure in, in the liquid. So that pressurizes uh, the, the chamber here, and then we ignite it with a solid rocket uh, igniter, and then we ignite it, and, uh, and that's the way it works. So this is the last three uh, entries in the competition. This was Aries three, the first team in the history of the 15-year competition to ever successfully launch a liquid rocket. Um, Aries four, and I should say, say successfully launch because this one blew up about a thousand feet above the launch pad. Uh, Aries four, we joined University of Michigan as the only teams to ever successfully launch and recover uh, a liquid rocket. So that went to about 3000 feet. And then Aries five, uh, we currently hold the record uh, for a liquid rocket. That one went to 9,700 feet. Uh, Aries six was designing a liquid rocket uh, to go to 30,000 feet, and we got cut short because of the pandemic. Um, and so Aries uh, 7, or I think we're calling it Aries uh, 6, uh, part 2, <laughs> is going to uh, try to get to 30,000 feet. Hey, um, Anthony, we have a quick question here from Benjamin. He says, is it easier to control the fuel to oxidizer ratio when using liquid fuel compared to solid or hybrid? Great question. So yeah, in fact, the fuel to oxidizer ratio for liquid, um, in our particular case, because we're pressure fed, okay, uh, that in fact, the fuel to oxidizer ratio really ends up being just a function of the, the total area of the injectors. Um, so basically, what we can do is, uh, uh, is just design the area of the the total area of all the little injectors for the fuel and, and the total area for all the little injectors, the oxidizer, and, and that sets the fuel to oxidizer ratio. And, it, and it's, it's pretty much constant throughout the whole burn. So we don't have to worry about that thing with hybrid where the fuel to oxidizer ratio varies. Good question. So I can get to movies uh, if there's some time. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, maybe as importantly as the movies, is uh, is our alumni program. So I didn't have time uh, to go back to 2014. Um, 
And uh, I just went back to 2018. And these are just the students that I knew off the top of my head. Um, so Wyatt Bryan, uh, he was in the, the, the 2019 team that went to 9,700 feet on the propulsion team specifically. He's now at Blue Origin, literally launching rockets for Blue Origin out in the, the, the desert in Texas. Uh, Danelle Lascano Consulman, she was the team leader for the 2020 team that got cut short. So unfortunately she wasn't able to launch, but she's now at Kennedy Space Center uh, as a permanent uh, NASA employee. Uh, Alec Willard, part of the 2019 team, he's at Ball Aerospace. Uh, Eric Hernandez, also part of the 2019 team, he's at Lockheed Martin. Uh, Taylor Morton, she was the team lead for 2018. Uh, she's now getting her master's degree in aerospace engineering at University of Michigan. Uh, and Trent Sieg, I should mention, he was on the propulsion team in 2018, and he's now uh, with the Oakland Raiders. So, um, so hopefully he'll, he'll be with the Oakland Raiders for 10 more years, and uh, and then after that he'll get back to his first passion, which is which is rockets. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and I'll open it up to questions. Um, uh, so yeah, any questions on the chemical rocket propulsion class or um, anything about chemical rocket propulsion or mechanical engineering or anything of that nature? Anthony, I'm not seeing anything in the chat at the moment and you have a few minutes to show some movies if you'd like. All right, let's see what I can do. So let me, how do I stop sharing? Uh, oh, I know what I need to do. First thing I need to do is I've got to get out of that mode there. And then I can go to, to let's go to that mode. Okay. Hey, Anthony, while you're doing that, we have a question from Jenna. She says, is liquid fuel commonly used in the real world? Yes. So, um, so right now for, for, you know, any commercial launch vehicle right now, it would be either liquid propulsion or solid propulsion or some combination thereof. So if we think about the space shuttle, for example, space shuttle had the two large solid rocket boosters, right? So they used to fuel um, aluminum particles plus a plastic binder uh, plus uh, ammonium perchlorate as the oxidizer. So those are all solids. And then the liquid propell propellants in that case would be liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Um, and then a lot of the new thruster, the, the new companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, they're using uh, liquid rocket uh, propulsion. Some of them are using um, uh, hydrogen, oxygen. Others might be using methane. I think Blue Origin is using methane in, in liquid oxygen. Um, and uh, just to put in a plug for Ellen Plesey, who's going to talk next, she worked for United Launch Alliance for years. And, she could tell you about, I'm sure, a lot about uh, United Launch Alliance rockets, which would be the Atlas, right, for example. Um, okay, so uh, so let's see if we've got some movies here. So the first thing is, uh, this is my, uh, my YouTube uh, uh, page. I didn't even know I had this, uh, but my son got angry with me because I was getting more views than his, uh, his YouTube page. So, um, but, but this is where I, car, I archive a lot of stuff here. So let's see, how about, um, all right, let's look at a, a static test fire first. So this is, that's one of our static test fires right before we launched the 2018 rocket. So that's here at CSU. We, we, we have uh, the benefit of being able to do, you know, static test fires here. And then here is, this is a cool one. So here's a super slow motion video of the 2019 rocket that went to 9,700 feet. One of the beautiful things about our ethanol and nitrous oxide rocket is, um, let me show that again or stop it, is most of that what you looks like smoke there is not smoke, that's actually just uh, sand. Um, but what you notice here is that there's hardly any smoke. 
right? I mean, it burns so cleanly. It's almost like the the uh, space shuttle main engines that just burn, they just clear blue kind of flame. And so, you know, when this launches, it's really quite beautiful. Um, hey, Anthony, uh, Jenna has a question. She says, which fuel options are more economically friendly and which are, I'm sorry, environmentally friendly and which are more cost effective? Those are really good questions. So. Uh, I guess you would say from an environmental standpoint, hydrogen oxygen is pretty darn good, right? Because the only exhaust product is, is water and some unburned hydrogen. So those are pretty benign to the environment. Whereas when I burn ammonium perchlorate with, uh, with uh, HTPB and aluminum particles, you kind of get some nasty stuff there, hydrochloric acid, uh, you know, various things. Um, uh, but, you know, generally we don't launch that many rockets when we compare it to, for example, you know, the, the exhaust from automobiles or coal fired power plants uh, to where we don't make a huge impact on the environment. It's obviously something we should be thinking about as a human race that, you know, is to have cleaner rocket propellants. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge deal. I would say locally, if you're in, you know, Cape Canaveral or whatever, you can't be really close to a, a rocket particularly when it's doing a solid rocket motor. In fact, uh, I've had the benefit to watch uh, some, some uh, launches in person and particularly the space shuttle because it had those solid rocket motors. Uh, since those, uh, the exhaust is pretty nasty, they kind of get you out of there pretty quickly after the launch, you know, a few, few minutes after the launch, they round you up because they don't want you to kind of be exposed to, to some of those uh, exhaust products. Um, in terms of cost efficient, well, you know, I think all in the solid rocket motors are actually more cost efficient because, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are what we call cryogenic. And so you have to cool those down to very, very low temperatures in order to maintain them in liquid form. And then if there's not a launch on that day, you have to, you know, if it gets aborted, you've got to You've got to pump the liquids back out and, and store them safely somewhere. And, and, um, and also the rocket engine itself, uh, liquid rocket engines are much more sophisticated and costly because you have a, a turbo pumps and a lot of equipment and, and whatnot, whereas solid rocket motors are very, very simple. Um, now I'll ask a question to the group. If solid rocket motors are so simple and cost effective, why don't we use them on all, um, launch vehicles, particularly launch vehicles when we're trying to launch humans to, to space. Does anybody know what the challenge or, or problem with solid rocket motors is? Uh, you can't turn them off as opposed to like if you're using liquid fuel, you can't, if you need to abort, you can't turn off the solid rocket fuel. Exactly. So the space shuttle was the first uh, launch vehicle that launched humans that actually used solid rocket motors. And um, you probably heard of the Challenger accident. That's probably before most of you were born at this point. But uh, you know, back in 1986, uh, that was because of a problem with the solid rocket boosters. Um, and um, and so it was thought for a long time that that would be the first and last time that um, that we would use solid rocket motors. Um, but I believe, as I understand it, uh, Ellen, you might know this, and I should know this. And it's embarrassing that I don't. I think the new um, uh, space launch system, which is uh, what NASA is developing, pretty sure that's going to use solid rocket boosters again, along with hydrogen oxygen. Yeah, that's correct, Anthony. And even the uh, the Delta Heavy um, does a combination of liquid and um, and solid. Yeah, yeah. And is the Delta Heavy? I know that hasn't been used to launch humans yet, but is it yet? And, I, and you guys, I think the students might be interested to know those solid rocket motors, sometimes there's liquid aluminum hanging around in them. It doesn't necessarily burn. And when it flows out through the nozzle, it can deform the shape of the converging diverging nozzle and cause the thrust to be vectored in an unknown direction. So they're, a, they're kind of quite complicated to work with in terms of that sort of thing that can happen. It's not super common, but it's very interesting. And also to mention one other thing. So we also do solid rocket motors. I di didn't mention, uh, they're also quite fun. And so, so this is uh, 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 
sucrose and potassium nitrate. Um, and uh, if you put those two things together, uh, they create uh, a fairly safe uh, and, and fun solid rocket propellant that we call rocket candy. So if you've ever seen that movie, October Sky, or read the book Rocket Boys, um, you know, they, uh, I don't know if they invented the term rocket candy, but that, that's one of the propellants that they, that they were using. So we also, we also do that. All right, thanks, Anthony. Right. Um, so Anthony, I'm gonna ask you to confirm that you can see my screen when I start sharing. And uh, maybe if you'd monitor questions for me, that would be helpful. Sure. I can see it. Okay, terrific. Okay, great. Full screen now. I put myself on mute. Yes, you're good. You're good. Okay, terrific. So hello everyone. My name is Ellen Pleasy and um, I work in the mechanical engineering department. I am not a professor in the mechanical engineering department. I have an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from what was then Missouri School of Mines, very similar to Colorado School of Mines uh, here in Golden, Colorado. And then I have a master's in business administration from Washington University in St. Louis. So when I graduated uh, with my undergraduate degree, I went straight into industry as a working engineer. And uh, although I, I have worked for several companies, I didn't actually quit. Um, I just was it because of consolidations within the aerospace industry and mergers and acquisitions. I worked for General Dynamics, Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, and then finally United Launch Alliance. Um, but it was all through mergers and acquisitions. So in my 30 year career, I spent approximately two years doing solid engineering. Um, my area of expertise was uh, structural design and stress analysis. And then I moved into project management after I received my MBA and I started managing missions. Um, for the most part, I worked on expendable rockets, large scale expendable rockets, both the Atlas rocket and the Delta rocket. Uh, the Atlas rocket has its heritage in general dynamics and then the um, Delta rocket has its heritage in, um, in, in uh, Martin Marietta. Um, I'm sorry, in Boeing. So I spent about 10 years doing project management work and integrating missions. And then I moved into program management where I was responsible for a whole array of uh, projects. Um, I was like the program manager for all the NASA missions for a while. Um, and then I retired a few years ago as the general manager of human launch services for United Launch Alliance. Um, what we were doing is we were modifying both the rockets and the launch pads to, um, to allow launching of humans into, um, into orbit, either International Space Station or on the Delta Heavy into deep space. And throughout my time, I learned a few important lessons along the way. Um, think analytically, build relationships, and work hard. But I have to tell you, um, there were many, many days and years when I couldn't believe I was getting paid to have so much fun. I, I had a wonderful career and really had a total blast working in the aerospace industry. So aerospace engineers, or what you would be is a mechanical engineering with an undergraduate concentration in aerospace engineering. They perform engineering duties, designing, constructing, and testing aircraft, spacecraft, satellites, and missiles. 
So, you know, you might look for job titles like flight test engineer. I actually started as an F-16 flight test engineer or structures engineer or structural analysis engineer. Those are the sort of jobs that are typical. Um, and those are the engineering positions I held when I first came out. The demand for mechanical engineers in the aerospace industry is very, very high. There are over 20,000 employees that are 55 or older and will be retiring soon. And there are approximately 6,500 job postings per month and only 1,500 hires per month. So there is an unsatisfied demand for mechanical engineers in the aerospace industry. And the compensation as a result is very high. Starting salaries are about 75K a year versus just a mechanical engineer maybe going into um, say Woodward might be around 68K a year. An average compensation after you've been in the industry for a while is about 120K a year. And the really cool part about this is there are many companies and which offer internships right here in Colorado. What we have now uh, within the mechanical engineering department is we are offering an undergraduate concentration that um, if as a student, when you get to your late in your junior year, you will come up, come to a point where you have to choose some technical electives to sort of um, hone your skills or to direct your interest. And so you would choose four technical electives in the aerospace engineering curriculum. This is not additional work. These, everybody has to take these four technical electives, but you can choose to take them from within the aerospace curriculum. In addition, of course, we're offering a graduate certificate and a master of engineering degree. So if you decide to stay on at CSU and further your education, those are available too. Um, for Jenna, these, these rockets that you're seeing here, and as Anthony pointed out, are a combination of liquid and solid. Um, so for example, if you look at the rocket in the middle there, the liquid propulsion is in the large tank in the center and the solid rocket motors are their smaller things um, on the edge here. These are the smaller solids. We have broad and deep aerospace course offerings. Um, and so what I would recommend to a student who's interested in aerospace, I would recommend that they either go broad, that is they take one course, maybe the four foundational courses across the top, one in fluid flow, one in propulsion, one in structures, one in materials and manufacturing, or they could choose to go deep. So maybe they say, boy, I really want to work with John Williams and I want to work in propulsion. So I'm going to take all four technical electives from within propulsion. And you'll see, in fact, that if you go just two courses down in the propulsion list, there's space propulsion and power engineering with Dr. John Williams. Or further down the list, broad beam ion sources with Dr. John Williams. Um, you also chemical rocket propulsion, Dr. Anthony Marchese, who just spoke with you, or down here, advanced combustion theory and modeling with Marchese. So lots of opportunities and lots of options in the course offerings that are available to students. We also have a rich uh, aerospace research program. We have over $16 million in active aerospace related research. Over 75% of it is from DOD, DOE, and NASA, and almost 65% of it is in the propulsion discipline. So that is an area where we feel like we have strength. Um, and if you look at other universities within Colorado, if you're interested in propulsion, we really are the niche, um, we have the niche position for propulsion. If you com compare our aerospace research with those of some of the highest ranking aerospace programs in the nation, we're right there with the big dogs. So we're at 16.4 million. You can see Caltech's at 14.1 or University of Michigan is 15.6. 
So we, um, what, why this is important to you is it represents the caliber of the faculty that we have on staff here at CSU in mechanical engineering. Okay. All right. Some of the aerospace research areas are in fluid mechanics, chemical propulsion, stability, control, and structures. And so these are some of the things we're doing. You can see there on the list ion thrusters, electric propulsion. We also do a lot of work. We have a couple of faculty that do computational modeling and simulations of hypersonic propulsion systems. And we also have a couple of faculty that work in the materials area. So the question that many of you might be asking yourself is, okay, I'm interested in this. Why should I choose CSU? So um, according to schools.com, CSU is, offers the best education. It's the number one four-year college in Colorado, and there's some statistics, but also it's the best value. That is, we offer the same education for lower tuition and fees. Also, as uh, Dr. Marchese pointed out, you will have an exceptional experiential learning. Um, we have a mechanical engineering advisory board um, that has quite a few representatives from industry on it. And they say CSU grads understand and can apply engineering concepts. And they aren't just book smart, they can build and test prototypes. And that's really, that is our brand at CSU is that you will have, all, almost all of our courses have a hands-on learning component. So you will know, you won't just understand the concepts, but you will know how they are applied and what they truly mean. Also, we have, we're number six in average research funding per faculty and <clears throat> best place to live. So here's some things um, that we've recently been awarded. We get accolades from Money Magazine, Outside Magazine, and Men's Journal about being the best place to live. We're also very friendly to uh, US veterans. Um, we, the College of Engineering online programs debuted in the top 20 in the nation, 14 among the best public universities for veterans. And most recently, the Mechanical Engineering Department established a scholarship fund for veterans who are particularly interested in the aerospace engineering program and declare their intention to pursue an undergraduate concentration in aerospace. Okay, so that's what I have. Any questions for me or any of my colleagues? Question from uh, Eric. I'm not, maybe Eric, you can expound a little bit. You said, is the aerospace program at CSU going to keep evolving? Um, so uh, by evolving, what do you mean on that? Where is it? So, so that's okay. I can jump in here. Um, yes, Eric, it is going to evolve. Um, right now, we are, um, we're just offering the undergraduate concentration, but next fall, that is fall of 21, we're going to, we are going to offer the master's degree and the graduate concentration. And we just did a review and um, of our coursework, our, our course offerings with our industry partners, our advisory board. And they recommended that we add some system engineering courses. So those are going to be added to the curriculum as well. So yeah, I do see it evolving. Um, in addition to that, our department head is actively searching for um, uh, a tenure track faculty member to add to our staff um, that has expertise and in aerospace engineering. So does anybody else have any overall general questions about mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, CSU, Fort Collins? <laughs> OK. 
Okay, I just a few points uh, here while we have everybody. So, um, you know, I do think um, one of the things that you heard today, um, you know, some really passionate faculty and uh, um, you'll get to take courses from John Williams. I, 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 I can't guarantee that his sense of humor is going to improve uh, between now and next year, but, uh, but you will definitely enjoy taking classes from, from him. Uh, and, uh, and others. Uh, and the other thing about CSU is, that, I mean, as I say all the time is, uh, you know, what's most important is that you find the university that's the right fit for you, right? And so, and that's a little bit more challenging right now with the pandemic. Uh, um, you know, normally you could come here and tour all of our labs. You could tour Dr. Williams labs. You can tour the powerhouse. Um, um, so that'll be a little bit more difficult, but we have a lot of virtual opportunities to tour. Um, and also, uh, you know, you can certainly come here and walk around campus and get a feel for for the physical campus. It's, you know, probably one of the more beautiful places to, to spend four or five years of your life. Uh, and so, um, and then, you know, as this, things evolve in the spring, we'll, we'll continue to, to stay in touch. And, you know, the students that really, where CSU resonates with are students who really like to solve problems and solve important problems and, and roll up their sleeves and, and, you know, and design and build things. Um, and I think you've seen that from uh, from the presentations today, and and I would say really that's just a small fraction of you know we could present for for ten hours, and 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 uh, you'd see more of uh, similar uh, projects. Um, you know, you saw Dr. Yallen's project. I mean, these are students out there flying you know you know drones and developing instrumentation, and and again, this is available not just for you know PhD students, right? I mean, we have students as early as first second year working in our research labs. All right. I'm not seeing any additional questions from anyone. Jackie? And Jackie posted in the chat uh, where to find the, the, the um, yeah, go ahead, Jackie, there you are. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I just want to say thank you all so much for your presentation today. It was awesome to hear from all of you and give a perspective of aerospace at CSU, which is super exciting. Um, and to those of you tuning in, please do stay in touch. As Dr. Marchese mentioned, we want to help you through this process. I know it's challenging not being able to um, really bring people to campus physically as much as we usually do, but we have a whole team of ambassadors, so current students that you can talk to as well, because um, it's really helpful to hear from current students and their perspective of what classes are like, what are those projects like, hands-on experience. Um, so please do click on that link. You can book a one-on-one -on -one appointment with a student and then also do a virtual tour with students as well. And then I'm going to drop my email in the chat. So I'm your go-to person for any questions that you might have about the application process, scholarship processes, um, literally anything you want to know as a prospective student. So thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jackie. Thank thanks, Jackie. Jackie. All right. Thanks, everybody. We hope to see you here next fall. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. <laughs> Thank you. And then Ellen, I'll get the recording from Tony Lee. Okay, great. Thank you. It should be on the cloud. <laughs>